What is it called? Are you even mm. called? What are you even called? Do you even have it written? Why don't you have it written on the name? I used to write the name of the deck on the deck box. Is it like Mute Mutant Mayhem? Because we can't do anything without being alliterative. Do you know, I don't... I don't, I don't love the naming conventions for commander decks. No? I, I genuinely... This makes me. This is going to make me sound like a real grandpa. I think they're too funny and casual. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I, I mean, know they're yeah. commander decks. And, and I, I'm also, do you know what I hate? It's the fucking stupid thing where they give you like the, the thing of like... Build up resources, create mayhem. I'm like, don't tell me how to play the deck. <laughs> you've already pre, you've already made the deck for me, and now you're telling me how to play it as well. Fuck off. Well, they did. They used to have the inserts where they had yeah. different commanders, but now it's literally do they written still on the... have. Do they still? Because I haven't bought a commander deck since I haven't opened a commander deck since Strixhaven. Like um, an honest to goodness. I'm pretty box. sure they do still put the uh, inserts with in. the different commanders in there, yeah, like yeah, lore yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they. Can't. I mean, I throw it away automatically because I don't. <laughs> If I want the lore, I'll go on the wiki page, you know. If I want the lore, I'll listen to the Magic the Flavor of podcast. Uh, even though they don't they don't read the insert, so how would they know? <laughs> uh, oh, well, I listen to the Borthos cast and copy what they say. Right, nice, nice. <laughs> <Ew>. <laughs> but yeah, like scrappy survivors. I'm like, okay, because they use the junk tokens, I guess, and stuff. Sure. I guess they're not, I guess it's, they, they're naming it as if someone who built the deck it has named it something, right? Yeah. Like, like Graham Stark calling it Bear Force One. Yeah. That, that, Rather you're... than having some kind of high fancy name. Yeah, what? Well, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Um, yeah. Um, what's the, what's loop? Not lupine. What's Erzin, uh, Erzine, Erzine ferocity? Good. What part of this awful thing is going to be in the cold? Over? <laughs> All of it. Good, great. Should we start? <laughs> Welcome to Magic the Flavor, the Magic the Gathering podcast, where we talk about all things magic, flavor, design, and lore. I'm your host, Andy Mann. Hello, this is Nathan Cancel. And we're about to talk about something that I'm super passionate about, 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 and that is Fallout. What I've got written here is another foray into peripheral IPs that we kind of know things about, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that... You've just basically... In one sentence, taken my entire argument against you. Why is it an argument? Why can't it be a discussion? Because I'm right. But you're actually sat to my left, but that's fine. Oh dear gosh. Uh, we are talking about <laughs> the uh, Fallout Commander decks that have been uh, released in honour of the game series Fallout. Mm-hmm. Four decks, similar to the Doctor Who IP, similar to the Warhammer IP. Um, that's it, right? So far it's only been the three... Iterations of, of Commander decks. Yeah. I think. No full set. No full set. Not like the Lord of the Rings set. Um, or the Assassin's Creed set that's going to be coming out, right? That's going to be a, its own, its own oh, set. Oh no, is it? Yeah, I think that's its own set rather than just oh, a Commander and product. I like Assassin's Creed. Well, well let's I played, see. I played, I played everything up until Assassin's Creed 3. Like, I played Assassin's Creed 3. Mm. And then I stopped owning gaming consoles like that. So I haven't played any since. I don't understand how he we went from... From Alien, Adam and Eve. Oh, spoilers! By the way, um, Adam, Adam and Eve's alien kind of civilization to ships and Vikings. Well, they after Black. F- oh no! After um, wasn't there Valhalla? It's when they made the switch to going instead of they progressively getting like uh, sort of like you know French Renaissance, Victorian London, mm-hmm. like that stuff. French Revolution, sorry. It's when they went to going, okay, we'll do like slightly more mythical settings. That's when they changed they did it up. Egypt as well, right? They've been to Egypt. That was the Norse uh, and stuff. Yeah, Origins. Right. The Egypt one was or- was like the origin one because that was meant to be like the first assassins mm. were from Egypt. They did Valhalla, which was Vikings, and they did Odyssey, which was the Greek one. And they included like straight up gods and shit right. as the baddies. Oh, okay. Crikey. Yeah. I mean, to, who's to say, you know, what's the difference between an alien and a god depending on which, how science you're well, getting I, about I, things, Yeah, right? I, I think that's maybe how they did explain it away. But also mm. they made it... This, we're just talking about Sans Creed now. We're well, it's, the, like, the point The point being that it's clearly... So the, 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 the reason why it's good to talk about it is because clearly there's enough range if you have been playing the entire series to so have a full set of Yes, it. okay, fine, yes. You know what I mean? Whereas, like, I, I mean, to be fair, this is... I think this spans this particular Fallout um, 4 decks, like, spans all of the games. So you've got Fallout 1, 2, 3... 
for New Vegas, and I don't think it really touches on any of like the ancillary ones, like seventy six. So I don't think seventy six introduced any new characters. If it did, sorry, my bad. I didn't play seventy six. Okay, yeah. So let's. What is your relationship to Fallout? I've played three. I've watched someone play most of four, and I've seen a couple of let's plays of bits of New Vegas. Mm-hmm. I have a I have a bit of knowledge of one and two just through. The law, knowing gaming lore, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. so there are certain characters. I'm like, oh, okay, that's from the first game. Um, obviously, I know about Bethesda quite, 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 quite a lot. Obviously, you're going to talk about it in a second. But Skyrim and and Fallout were kind of the analog of. Do you want to play sci-fi or fantasy within mm. the same kind of RPG, run and gun, first person kind of gameplay thing? So I've played a couple of the games. Um, not we'll get into it, but not enough to be able to go. Oh my god, I remember that character from that quest and the thing that they said and the mm. thing that they did. And oh my god, I remember going into that building, like. Again, it's kind of like Doctor Who of where I've had enough immersion to understand what they're going for, but not so much that I'm like super, super, super geeking out on, on, on everything. There are certain things I'm definitely nerding out over, but I don't have the full scope. Yeah. I haven't played any Fallout games. My ex played 76. Mm-hmm. At, I think she came to it quite late. It was when they'd kind of done their first round of revamping to make it not complete shite. <laughs> um and so I've watched I've watched her play that mm-hmm. on the sofa as I'm playing Nintendo or something on the Switch. Uh, I know about it tangentially, as you say, through like gaming lore and just kind of being you know existing in the world that we exist in, mm-hmm. <laughs> where gaming like news is around. And uh, I've played a lot of Skyrim, so obviously mm-hmm. I know a lot about Bethesda there. But then even on Skyrim, this is this is going to get me just straight up gaming cancelled. <laughs> I only ever played Skyrim on the Nintendo Switch. Interesting. Well, I mean, I, to be fair, that's out, what the eighth iteration of, of the games. So. Well, you can play Skyrim. I, I'm led to believe in a Pit Boy in one of the Fallout games. Oh, that's funny. That's cool. Or something similar. I'm nice. pretty sure. I think there's like some some. Sort I mean, of I like Bethesda likes doing throwbacks, right? You, yeah. They had Notch's axe at the top of one of the um, mountains in Skyrim yeah. as well. And so let's let's pause on that for a moment because it's interesting that of the IPs they chose considering Bethesda obviously owns and, and, and created both Skyrim and Fallout, that they went for Fallout over Skyrim when Skyrim technically would fit. Or the Elder Scrolls. Yeah, like that's what yeah, I mean. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, Elder Scrolls. Like, considering that that would technically fit the lore of magic a little bit like more closely, would it be too similar to just doing like, okay, we've just done Lord of the Rings, it's, that's generic high fantasy. And let's be honest, El- Elder Scrolls is generic high fantasy you know you can choose between high elves drow elves all that kind of thing you've got your all your regular normal fantasy enemies and tropes and everything so maybe it was too similar to all of the other things that they do and they wanted to maybe flex back again i mean we, we talk about this a lot about how old school magic did have this kind of um cyberpunk not cyberpunk um like um what, what did you call it not steampunk What's, what was what was the mechs the mech the mech time? Oh, like diesel punk. Diesel punk. That's yeah, it. Yeah, that yeah. kind of idea. And this is very much within that realm, right? Yeah, Fallout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the Fallout games are post-apocalyptic. Yeah, maybe a little bit atomic punk as well. Yes, there, exactly. Yeah. And it got it has almost kind of like that sixties, especially Fallout Four. Mm-hmm. Um, very much has that beginning thing where you have like the little suburb things. It reminded me a lot of the scene out of um, Indiana Jones and the Temple of the Crystal Skull. Yeah, you know, yeah, where I know the one. exactly <laughs> that. That for me is quintessential Fallout of where it's twee and everything is kind of old time radio you know and i like that fact of where it's futuristic but it feels like it's also a throwback to a to a, to a more innocent time where you know we thought we'd build nuclear fusion weapons and fusion weapons and then blow up the world why yeah. wouldn't we yeah well it's, it's got that stuff in there it's also got like wastelander like ips in there it's got like 1950s mad maxi kind of mad vibes. maxi but it's also got yeah 19 sort of 40s and 50s detective noir things going True. on as well yeah especially like, it's got a, it's, new vegas has that kind of yeah, it's noir a real film. celebration i think of just americana in general like mm. post-world war ii americana which i mean hey it's a real aesthetic and you know mashing it all up and i think obviously knowing about the games and as much as I understand what they're going for in their IP, it's all it's all a comment on mm. the American dream and the idea of like, you know, what what constitutes America as a country and a society and mm. and you know, there are characters in it which which kind of touch on that in lots of different ways and that's the whole point. So I think it's a really interesting IP to pick. Before we get maybe into individual cards, I would say I'm I'm gonna throw like a big broad thing out there. When when the Walking Dead cards first came out mm. as the first sort of official foray, foray into universes beyond, and that was only what like what, seven or eight cards or whatever. That what, the Walking Dead is a similar idea of where it's a post-apocalyptic America, and a lot of the themes that they touch on in the graphic novel and in the TV show is about what 
does that country look like when society crumbles mm. like in terms of you know its societal structure its religious values the whole thing is very much like hey we're dealing with zombies but really it's the people who are the real monsters yeah. and like you know all that kind of thing that's like the zombies are just like the faceless menace in the back that's pushing all of the narrative for the you know the individual stories of struggles and and all of the yeah, exactly. character arcs right so it's a similar ip in that respect so maybe we've because it's a video game it's a bit more palatable and because it's presented in a much more tongue in cheek way to say the walking dead it's much more palatable but then you get to like more direct comparisons where even down to the idea of one of the big controversies with the walking dead one was negan being on a card mm. the character of negan where he's like literally a dictator or sociopath murderer mm. and his literal baseball bat weapon of choice being an uh, equipment card yeah now, there is a token that was on your desk when I walked in today from this Fallout set of a zombie mutant. Mm -hmm. What weapon is he holding? I believe it's a... Is it, isn't it a, la is it a laser? I don't know. <laughs> Funny, yeah. Uh, spiked, spiked baseball, baseball bat. bat. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying, obviously, there's... there's uh, for the podcast where we talk about the nuance of flavour, mm. right? I'm not saying that we can't have spiked baseball bats in Magic the Gathering. But what I'm saying is... And I think I seem... In the annals of my mind, I seem to remember saying this at some point, either out of... In conversation or maybe on, on air. Someone can tell me. What... Is it maybe a bit of a, a hypocrisy that everyone went, ugh, because The Walking Dead was maybe just not as many people's cups of tea by that point. But because Fallout has this massive cult following, especially in gamer circles, which Magic the Gathering is, is it sort of like, oh, it's terrible until it's the thing that I like and now it's okay? I think it's exactly that. Okay. I think. I think, <laughs> so the biggest thing I think is that they didn't like ease into to UB, right? They just kind of went, for for whatever reason, maybe it was a specific, specific a contract or whatever that Hasbro chased, and it was really lucrative or whatever. And apparently, it was still one of the highest selling and most like best selling products. Like yeah, they've, they've, was, they've yeah. sold. Um, they use that scalpers, as an whalers. To keep doing it more. Yeah, scalpers, yeah. whalers probably actually dictated that more than there being a genuine fan base for it, for the for the product. But I think massively, you're talking to gamers, right? Not a lot, not necessarily a lot of people playing Magic: The Gathering would have watched The Walking Dead like religiously or really enjoyed it. You know, it's a big HBO show that might not be something they're into. You might, you could have also chosen True Blood, you know, or House of Cards, or you know, any other random IP that that is the the zeitgeist TV show that everyone's watching. Lost, you could have done a Lost universes beyond, and I think yeah, that would yeah, have yeah. been similar kind of vein. I think a big issue that people had was that they went for a subject that was so counter to the age appropriate 14 plus of magic whereas fallout is a game that you can play as a kid interesting whereas i don't think walking dead is a series you should watch as a kid so i feel like it pours so it doesn't feel quite as bad when it's a zombie mutant who's clearly fantastical carrying a, a, a spiked baseball bat because that feels a little bit more um the immersion the, 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 dis the disbelief is easier to hold whereas it's just generally that guy over there who I've seen battering the crap out of my main characters, and there's the actual bat. Like, it, it, it feel like there's so there's a bit of separation. So I mean, I'm I'm coming at this. It's it's funny the difference between this and the Doctor Who episode. I'm coming at this as someone who I don't have a pro or a negative against Fallout because I I know about it enough that I can understand what it's trying to do. But it's not like we're Doctor Who where I'm like, oh, I know a lot about Doctor Who because I kind of grew up with it being on my TV and I've watched mm. a fair amount of it myself. Which is why I know I don't like it. And, you know, sure. as an IP, you know, as a magic product, it's a different sort of thing. But with this, I, I'm fairly neutral, as you pointed out to me. I'm like, actually, I'm not pro or against. So I say this with genuine question. Mm. The character of Caesar, mm. as in Caesar's the Season's Legion, is that what it's called? Caesar's Legion. Now, I saw, it was. I'll be fully honest, it's not like I'm going to come at this with, like, I suddenly have all this knowledge that I said I didn't have. I saw there was a bit of controversy about Caesar being a character on a card. I looked up why there was controversy. And it's he's from Fallout New Vegas. He's a, a tyrant of his own faction, and that faction styles themselves after the Roman uh, Empire. Mm. I always try and be clever and say either Roman Republic or Holy Roman Empire, but I'm not going to try and be clever. He's the, the Romans. We know what the yeah. Romans look like. And people are like, okay, so not only is that there's a non-zero amount of the idea that the Nazis in World War Two often had a lot of Roman iconography mm. as part well, the of banner, the banners and everything. They, they loved know. all that kind of stuff and the idea of it being like a Holy Roman Empire and him as a character and his faction are like slavers and they're like misogynistic and they use kids as like weapons and baits and all this kind of thing, mm. which, which fits entirely into the game. But now we're saying that a lot of this knowledge and nuance and character thing and he's now on a card mm. and... There is, I think there is a difference between 
that. But you can tell me how you feel about it. Whereas we know characters and say, like, in fucking Dragons of Tarkir, so that we're saying that the Silumgar and, like, you know, Tasker weren't doing all that similar shit. Right. But because it's a fan, it's really high fantasy shit, mm. albeit based on a, on a, a real world, like, sort of, you know, uh, mythology. Where, where Where's the line? Here? Well, Yorgmoth was pretty fucking bad, right? And the right. stuff that he did. With, so it's, it's the way I look at it, right, is that, yeah, you can look at what's the kind of story that ma- the, the, the story that the magic um, creators have control over. Well, what, what's the furthest they pushed? What's the kind of narrative they were willing to, to explore? And I think if you go back far enough, obviously nowadays everything's kind of a little bit trimmed down and made nicey-nicey for, in general because wider audience, you don't want to offend anybody and it makes sense to do so. But you look back at some of the older stories, and I think that some of the things that were happening in there were as bad as the storylines in Fallout, if not worse. It's just they're not necessarily so on the nose. Like in Fallout, it's much more. It's where they're not hiding the ridiculous, the the the, the, the uh, sadistic uh, qualities of humans. They're going. They're actually presenting and going. This is as bad as people can be when put under absurd situations or you know apocalyptic situations. Um, and we'll look at that a little bit later when we talk about some of the uh, the vault stories. Because I think, um, I think again, the whole point of the game was to kind of have this uh, this pushed, qu- and you get away with it because it's quirky, turning cheek. And I think the set as well still gets away with that. But yeah. I think the problem is with the Walking Dead is it didn't have that presentation of no, going it was very somber. It was just on the yeah, nose. Yeah, yeah. And then in Magic, they try and avoid the dark truth that they're suggesting, but there is the suggestion of it anyway. It's just well, that it's yeah, not it's, presented. It's a narrative openly. device. Like I, I fully accept that. Mm. I'm not. I'm not a complete idiot. Like I understand that the Fallout games get away with the stuff that they get away with, like many video games. A because there's that. That obviously there's that scare of like video games make people violent and it's like I don't think anyone holds up a controller and thinks well I'm definitely killing zombies with my you know gun or whatever mm. like there is they use that narrative framing and like you know it's a medium and you can use the medium of like tongue in cheek Americana satire to tell these stories and like no one's suggesting although although I think in my rabbit hole I think some people were getting angry because some people were suggesting that Caesar was justified but like the game is not suggesting that Caesar is a justifiable no. self-righteous character a uh, righteous character he's like he's a tyrant he's a mm. maniac it's just it's just interesting to me that the way that magic always gets away with it is because magic narrative was doing what magic narrative was doing and that's how they could tell these high fantasy stories mm. and as soon as you start bringing in these other IPs with the universes beyond you start having to not do things how magic does things. You mm. start having to do things how they do things. Sure. And so to have these two characters that I've just kind of... I've seen from my not... I've seen two seasons of The Walking Dead, and obviously it was a cultural phenomenon. I've seen people play Fallout, but I haven't engaged with it myself, so I feel like they're kind of comparative levels of engagement. See these two characters that, to me, as a person who mm. understands fantasy narratives, look similar. And one's... One was really rinsed, and the other one was like, "Oh, hey, he's just he's in the game. That's interesting." You know. I wonder if it was the other way around, and we'd started with Fallout. If the kickback would have been as large, and then having years of kind of getting used to it, yeah. and then they release now a Walking Dead secret lair, people would be more okay with it because they're like, "Okay, we've actually had time to get used." I think the to backlash it. would certainly be less. I yeah. don't know. If, I don't know if people would be totally chill. No. Um, and I guess yeah, it's one of those things of where yeah, I, I guess the my argument or my my, my pre- prevailing argument when it comes to why I like universes beyond is because it gives us a way to see the magic system translate a different story, you know, and, and translate something that otherwise. We haven't seen in the game, you know, like it's what, what how did I write? Like, it's like a designing, it's like designing fan fiction, you yeah. know, of where you get to take this thing that you really like and put it through the magic lens. And maybe it's the opposite that there is a little bit of the reverse of where magic gets changed a little bit because of the universe as it's trying to translate. Sometimes, I mean, if you try, if you do, you know, if you do filter enough language of certain thing, you start to take on aspects of it in your own regular, you know, vernacular. So maybe there is a degree of that of where they maybe five years down the line they'll be more willing to be flexible with certain certain things like they're still doing you know thunder rifles for the bastards of thunder junction of where it's like mm-hmm. it's magic but it's clearly now we even got like a trigger and a handle like yeah, yeah, we're getting yeah. closer and closer towards like actually just having guns in a regular magic set so maybe there is a little bit of where we're feeding off of these more mature ips and it's actually kind of eking into the game more but again i still think you look for you look back at some of the story arcs and i don't think that they were all peaches and cream well i mean you i suppose i'm making all this argument with a sort of slightly satirical nuanced you know fallout series and walking dead when i'm completely blindly walking past the warhammer decks mm. <laughs> and the intentionally almost hilariously grim dark horrific 
hyper sexualized in some ways hyper violent hyper religious like satire that they're trying to go mm. for but i think because that's so extreme to me that's almost like going oh well you know that's it, of you know s- space demons in power armor you know with s- slaves well yeah it's the year 40k different. right like i guess that the, the, the difference is certain things feel more grounded and closer to reality like fallout is only like a step like a, a half step in a parallel universe of if what happened if we'd pressed the button? Yeah. yeah Whereas yeah. War, for Warhammer Forty K is is quite far removed in terms of like that's that's a parallel universe where lots of things are yeah. different and it's very far in the future. So it's just weird. Thirty five thousand years into the yeah, future. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like it's just it's just a bunch of weird species all fighting each other. So it's yeah. very hard to then kind of like go like, oh, well, should you be doing that? That's pretty bad. It's like you can't you can't relate to that world. <laughs> okay, that world has literal space gods. Who are you talking to Magnus Kalgar about what you can? Yeah, exactly. Do? <laughs> right. Whereas yeah, fair enough. It's a lot. It's a little easier to criticize these when you go oh okay of course in 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 a post-apocalyptic society there would be dictators and tyrants and maybe we don't want to see that in the magic maybe we don't want to see that in magic the gathering but it would be a disservice i think to not at least show that aspect of the fallout universe in a deck somehow yeah so again keeping it contained in four decks is it gives enough room to to show most of what they want to show Without it feeling like they have to, uh, with uh, they're missing too much, but also so they can actually do a service to enough of it. I suppose my last thought on this, because this is, I guess this could be an entire podcast series, let alone just like this episode, and then we've got other things to talk about. But I suppose my my rounding full circle on this is that if they didn't include the characters like Caesar, or if they were like, oh, spiked baseball bats, if say if that was really a thing, yeah. no, no one has complained about that. That was just my visual, like, hey, I, was, I noticed this kind of parallel. They didn't include those. It's sort of like going, oh, we're picking and choosing this entire IP, and we're almost censoring it to put it into our right. game. Either you, either you can do Fallout, or you don't do Fallout. Yeah, exactly. So I do respect that as well. Yeah, because I guess compared to something like Doctor Who, it, Doctor Who is already on, already on the BBC. It's already heavily censored in terms of like what it, it limited on how explicit it can be with certain things like gore, swearing, you know, very adult content, that kind of thing. Yeah, the most yeah, you're yeah. going to get is. We're going to hint at this totalitarian like society, but we're not going to really show you the true reality of it because it's a kid show about about space drama, you know. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. so, again, Fallout does touch on much harsher and like re- like it, at its, in its depths, Fallout is really hauntingly grounded. Like I mean, there are certain like experiments and certain like little bits of lore that you'll read and you'll be like, oh god, that's like horrifically relatable because I completely understand what like the, the extreme some people would go to. So. I think, yeah, I think, again, if you like the games, I feel like it's not done, it's not avoided the content that you would be hoping to see from the set. Similar to the 40k, I feel like it did just about enough of making it, it's violent, it's 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 grim, and it's and it's horrible, and it's got, like, you know, I mean, again, they didn't do the chaos or the orcs or anything like that, but the, the ones that they did show off, I think, were good. Um, four decks. Yeah, man. Four decks. Uh, we have Science, which is the Jeskai deck led by Madison Lee. This is more showing all of the human side of things, you know, being the Steel Legion um, or, uh, sorry, no, the Brotherhood of Steel and all the various other, like, human factions that are probably trying to help, but actually at the end you realise they're probably the bad guys. <laughs> um, and that's all an energy-based Jeskai deck. Uh, you've got Mutant Menace. Which is kind of like similar to the um, villains deck that we got for the Doctor Who from the Doctor Who series of that's a Saltai deck that's based around mutants and ghouls and it's led by the Mothman. Is it the Wise Mothman? Or the Wise it? Mothman. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yes, yes, indeed. Um, and then you have uh, oh god, oh, again it's a million tabs. Sorry guys, I do this every time. Um, Scrappy Survivors, which is a equipment and aura fusion um, a fusion with uh, head by um, uh, fucking dog meat. Um, who's your trusty companion, a dog companion? I don't want to get into it, but there are way too many legendary dogs now. So they have made four. So it was funny because people ask, like, oh, you're going to get the. Uh, which deck are you going to get from the Fallout series? I'm like, well, I'm not going to get the dog meat deck because I already have an artifact equipment deck. I already have an aura deck. I already have two cat and dog decks. Yeah. So I don't need another cat and dog artifact equipment deck. It's almost like they went, hey, you know, equipment decks aren't, over, uh, aren't overdone, right? It's like, uh, yeah. You know how, like, aura decks aren't overdone? It's like, well, actually, those aren't really overdone. Yeah, you know how, like, cats and dogs aren't overdone? Well, here, here, have some more dogs. Because I think there's like three dogs in the deck. There's Rex, Dog Me, and then Three Dog, who isn't technically a dog, he's a human, but I think he might be in that set, in, in that deck as well. But, you know, it's dogs picking up equipment and stuff. It, the Ludo narrative doesn't really make a lot of sense when you think about it, um, when you've laid, laid all of these things on a dog, but it's fine. It's cute for those people that like it. Like our, um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it in, in, properly in a moment, but our, our mate AJ is a massive Fallout fan. Um, and he's going to be shilling out for all of all of the decks. And he's originally bought the um, dog meat deck by itself. He said it plays really well. It's a lot of fun. Um, have you? Did you watch? You've, you haven't watched game nights in years, have you? 
Last game nights I watched, and this is no shade <laughs> to to game nights or the Command Zone podcast. I listened to it religiously for like the first sort of two or three years of me playing Commander. Mm. Like every, I've, I've listened to like maybe maybe their first sort of like. 200 episodes I must have listened to each of them at least three times I'm not mm. joking and Game Nights is great but I just sort of fell out with watching them and I don't think the last one I could probably look at my YouTube watch list I think the last one I didn't watch was the second as in the first one I didn't watch was the second uh, listener one you know where they get in like the oh right yeah yeah the fan one and okay, a, that is any quite of them ago, yeah. since then I don't think I've watched. Okay, yeah, because they did a obviously they did they they played all four decks against each other and um, I think I think I think I think seeing them play all against because I've only seen um, I've only got the mutant menace deck so I've only seen it in play by uh, in person, um, but the decks seem to do quite cool things and then the fourth one um, is the hail caesar deck as as you spoke about where it talks uh, it has um, most like raiders. Um, it's a Mardu deck uh, attacking stuff. You know they're not breaking any new ground with what the decks are doing. You know like there's apart from the rad mechanic from the mutant menace which is um, various different cards in the deck will give players rad counters radiation counters um, and they work um, the, at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase if you have round red, rad counters you mill that many cards for each non-land card you mill you lose a counter and you lose a life um, and the idea obviously being that you know how how radiation has entropy like you'll you'll gain it and then slowly over time it will it will, it will um what's the word What's the word? Decay. There we go. Fantastic. Good. But there isn't any decayed in the deck. Right. Because that would be confusing. That would be confusing. <laughs> so those are the four decks. Um, I, I've, I've not gone through all of them with like meticulous detail. I think the plan was originally to... I, I was going to try and buy a couple of the decks. I've only bought the one. I think I think all four of the decks are very, very serviceable. There's a bunch of new cards. Similar to the Doctor Who decks, most of the cards in the decks are new. Um, and then are there are really? some reprints. Because when I was going through the, the deck lists... It looks like, just to mark, without counting, that there was a much more balanced, like, um, just new arts or maybe a reskin of a couple of cards. Do you know what I mean? Like, whereas the Doctor Who ones felt like almost every single card aside from basic lands were, were well, new. Let's do a quick... I might be completely wrong. One, two, three, four. So if you take out, like, the mana base, like, in the... Um... Uh, Man rocks. Mm-hmm. I think you're probably looking at about 75, 25, 75 percent new, twenty five percent old. Really? And the old ones typically, or like reprints, typically are all of like the utility things. Yeah, so like your, far so you can call your ramp spells exactly. Chaos Even Ward. things like inspiring call, um, heroic intervention, those kind of cards, yeah. like your protection, the, 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 I, your I, bread I, and butter. I actually going through them without necessarily talking about each of them individually. I thought the the flavor on all of those utility cards was really good and mm. and didn't feel I don't know why I don't know why maybe I just really really don't like Doctor Who more than I thought but it didn't feel as jarring to me as the Doctor Who ones did I'm yeah. quite sure why I feel like there's there's definitely certain ones that I I think there's in the Warhammer decks I think the Farseek has a person on a motorbike like can I get and, and, and for me that felt a little bit jarring even though it actually makes more sense because you can seek further on a bike than you can walking <laughs> you know like I don't actually think the original Farseek from Ravnica translates as well because it just looks like oh I go and stand on the balcony and I can look across multiple districts from multiple different guilds and that he's, gives me he's, the op- he's using a telescope yeah and it gives me the opportunity to then tap into a ley line of a different colour I'm like that doesn't make as much sense as going out on a gallivanting you know walk and like in the far seat from this particular set mm. is you know you, you on the edge of a, of a cliff like looking out over the world of, ahead yeah, of you yeah I quite like that um, the fan strike back was the last episode fans of game rights that I when I keep saying the last, I mean it's the, it's the first episode of Game Nights that ended up in my watch later pile, mm. and I haven't watched that one or any of them since. So we're talking around like Nuka Penna time. Wow, yeah, that's quite a while ago. Quite it? a while ago for the amount that they put out. Anyway, and I also think that the Reaper and Equity of the cards that they put in were actually pretty good. Um, you've got things like you know Guardian Project in the set, as I said, I already mentioned um, Heroic Intervention. I don't think like they skimped necessarily. I think the value of the of the of the decks is quite good. Yeah, yeah. Um, other than radiation, the only other mechanic I think they added in was junk tokens. Now, this is another defined token, yeah. another artifact defined token. So instead of having, so now we've got clues, treasures, blood, map. Mm-hmm. Am I missing any? Clues, treasure, blood, map, gold. 
Gold, yeah, but gold is tra- gold well, kind of gold, but it's different. It's different. It is different. Um, and now we've got junk, which do it's the same similar thing. One t- tap sack, and then you exile the top card of your library. I think you play until the end of turn. Um, I'm not going to check that. It might be until the next time. I'm pretty sure it's until the end of turn. Little impulse draw. Cool. That's another an- another thing. Oh, there's scrap as well, but scrap doesn't do anything. So that was from Dominaria. Oh, great. Yeah, no, Dominaria United. Um, so those are the only two new mechanics they that they uh, brought in. I do feel like these are the kind of places where you can add old mechanics in, and it feels. Do you know how we were talking about this a couple a couple of a couple of episodes ago about like how well, what, why don't sorry crime is happening apparently. <laughs> well, there we go. The crime has stopped. Um, fuck what was what was I saying? I do feel like yeah, this is the kind of place where you can put in certain mechanics like the random one off evolve card. And it feels oh, like, would be good. and it works really, really well. I mean, in, in specifically in the in the uh, mutant menace deck, there's a uh, the rad stag which um, evolves whenever you evolve it. Um, it splits and makes a copy of itself. I mean, there is the mutate mechanic. There is the mutate mechanic, which they actually don't use in this no. at all. They use monstrosity a couple of times, like they um, I'm kind of like going into like individual picks a little bit here as well. The alpha death claw being um, a 6-6 six, six for 6 that Menace Trample when it enters the battlefield all becomes monstrous destroy target permanent because when it when you first, when it comes into play and it first racks up it fucks your shit up hmm. and then if you weren't if you weren't sure about it fucking your shit up for an extra 7 mana you can monstrify it make it a 10-10 and it will fuck your shit up and destroy another permanent again <laughs> because that's what Death Claws will do yeah. it will fuck your shit up like, that's very scary and that's why I think I kind of like I mean the thing the thing I like about this is that because it's less about a TV series where you might have individual responses or individual um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like defined interactions. Yeah. Um, so whereas this, because you are in control of, of, of the things that happen and they kind of have to be a little bit more um, general, I guess, with what they choose and what they yeah. what they want to represent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are a few things I think um, here that, that, that play across all of the decks that I think are very good. One of them is uh, Traits. Obviously, as a Fallout character, as you're going and you're self-developing, you can choose different traits and different perks. Sorry, I should say, I think in some games it's called traits and some some um, games it's called perks. And there are some that I think are very, very, very clever that are in here. Um, one of which being uh, the Wild Wasteland perk, which is where you select it and just random things will happen in your game. And as a card, it's two and a red for an enchantment. You skip your draw phase because things aren't happening normally anymore and instead you exile the top two cards of your library and you may play those cards that turn. You don't know what's going to happen, but it's going to happen now. Little things like that, when you read it, and I go, that's great. That's great. I feel like that is perfect flavour translation from the game into magic using magic abilities to make the thing feel like it felt in the game. And I think there's a few up, a few, a few versions of this um, throughout uh, the set that I think are exceptionally clever. Inventory management. Mm-hmm. Red, white, instant. For each aura and equipment you control, you may attach it to a creature you control. I've missed one very specific thing. Because when you do this in the game, it pauses the game, right? And nothing can interact with you. So, of course, it has split second. Oh, very cool. So, it's the idea of where... And the same thing with VATS. V-A-T-S is your targeting system. Two black, black. um, Split second. You may just choose any number of creatures that share a toughness. And then destroy that many creatures. And the idea being that... I guess that the flavour for that is that you only have a limited amount of resource. You can only kill enough things if you have enough resource to kill them. Like, they'll have to be... But again, that split-second idea of you've opened up your inventory. You know, everything stops. No one can interact with it. You're going to do this thing and then everything can go back to normal again. Mm -hmm. Now, that's that's not something... That's that's, that's something where you don't normally have the opportunity um, in the game of Magic, say, necessarily to go, right, okay, stop, pause for a moment. Um, to kind of like you know and that, and that moment in the in the game shouldn't be able to translate over to magic but then they go well actually we've actually got this amazing mechanic that we d- use very sparingly that we don't mm-hmm. like using because it's very ultra powerful but it exactly defines that mechanic within the game and the fact that magic has such and this is one of the reasons why I like the fact Ooh, that more crime you know, always more crime more crime in the other direction you, you go get them <laughs> And I do feel like now we've got 30 years of magic, or 30, well, I guess 31 years now of magic and me- mechanics, like the amount of things that, 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 that you can translate into the game, I think, I th- and the annoying thing is I think we're only like tip of the iceberg, you know, when we've got, I hate the idea that we've got Marvel and, fan- and Final Fantasy on the horizon from like a, uh, gross, please stop, stop fusing everything into this game. Mm. But now I, every, with every IP that I see, it makes me look at them and go, okay, maybe... Maybe they'll do it all right. Maybe it won't be. Is Mar- is the Marvel set just going to be three hundred legendary creatures? I honestly don't know how they're going to handle it. I think are they going to just go by? Are they going to do the Lord of the Rings thing of where they go by the comics, or are they going to do that what they've done with like you know Fallout of where they're going? Okay, let's take it by the modern media. 
Oh no, because obviously yeah, Marvel snaps. Is it them. is it MCU or is it Marvel? I don't think it is MCU. So if it's not MCU, then you can thankfully it's not going to be like here's Robert Downey Jr. It's just going to be here's a generic Iron Man, which might make it feel less twee, which then might make it feel more. Yeah, but what I mean is, is like every superhero is a, is a legend. True, and I guess like the law that people tend to know things like Marvel by the story, like by the characters more than by the storylines. Whereas in this, you've got a bunch of sagas, each of which explores a different vault story from yeah. the game and that's one i think one of the most fun things from the fallout games is just racking up to a random random shelter random vault and going let's open up and find out what experiment they were doing on the inside of this one because vault tech were bastards by the way yeah, they yeah. knew they knew that this this fallout thing was uh, that the nuclear fallout was going to ha- was going to happen they put all of these random experiments across the fucking nation and every time you go to one you know it's going to be some manner of bullshit everyone i think you're probably even aware of it of the gary the gary vault yeah gary and there is obviously a Gary clone in the in in the set. Oh, let me quickly find him. Do, 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 do. Gary. Yeah, I I have seen lots of videos. You know those kind of like listicle videos where it's like the top ten most effed up things in video games. And yeah. Fallout was always on there. It's always on there. So Gary, the Gary clone, one in a white for a one three squad two. So being able to pay an extra two mana for a copy of it, and then each when Gary clone attacks. Each other creature named Gary Clone gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. With the flavour text obviously being Gary. Because, of course. And it's things like that, I think, are fantastic. But the other 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 vaults um, are shown. The one that I'm going to talk about is Vault 11, The Voter's Dilemma. And this is a vault where once per year um, there needed to be a sacrifice. And it worked out after the first sacrifice that they wanted to then have a voting situation of where you had someone in charge who would then be able to... Um, be in control of who it was that was getting sacrificed. I think in the end they, they even like did a they drew straws instead to make it random. Like and it's, it's it's really fucked up. And what ends up happening is right at the end when it gets down to like the last like five people, um, uh, they find out that they didn't actually have to sacrifice anybody. It was a test of their humanity. And had they not sacrificed anyone the first time, the vault door would have opened and would have let them out. And in the in the light of that knowledge, four out of the five of them kill themselves because mm-hmm. of the knowledge that they've been slowly but surely killing their own society. For something they didn't even have to do. Now that's fucked up. Is it really cool storytelling? Absolutely. Yeah. And I like that every single one of the one, not every single one, but a lot of the really cool vaults do get translated into a saga. Again, sagas being a fantastic way of telling a story. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And again, each vault was its own individual story. I think again, like it's it's that ma- again, it's magic has so many different ways of telling stories and having mechanical flavor delivery. That, that there's so many that you can pretty much, I think, cover most most bases for most IPs at this point. I think you could probably translate, almost, I want to say almost anything into a magic set. It just depends on how much does it feel like it's it's pushing the boundaries of the set too far. Like how many new mechanics do you have to make for that in-world universe to feel like it works? So for example, like with Baldur's Gate and um, Dungeons and Dragons, the flavor text, you know, the flavor text keywording of, of the abilities. Now, was that necessary to kind of deliver the set? Yes. Was it something that we were able to accept within, like, after, because it, it was new and we didn't necessarily at the beginning kind of particularly shine to it immediately. Is it something that then kind of worked? Absolutely. So, is, again, is, 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 there, is there a limit on what I think the, the, the IP or the, the magic system should be stretched? Yeah, but I feel like Fallout somehow has managed to tuck itself in pretty succinctly i don't think there's i don't think there's any cards in here that i look at and i go oh magic really shouldn't be doing this yeah i it's interesting isn't it we we often talk and we're not the only channel to do so we often go on and on and on about how the five color system and the the kind of nuances between how those work and how that weaves into things from you know creature design to spell design to fucking lands really allow us to have a huge spectrum going on. And, you know, as, as much as sometimes you go, okay, Red White needs to maybe look at a different facet other than just, like, Righteous Army, there's, there's still the core tenets of what they're trying to do is all there. And it does, it really is a testament to magic as a design that it can fit all these different things in. I mean, I was looking at the lands of this set and I was looking at the temples because they've got all the temples, like the scry temples in here. Mm-hmm. And actually, as much as you could debate the word temple in these things as a literal temple because obviously they were introduced in the Theros blocks right the ideas of what they've got in the colour combinations and obviously the colour combinations feed into the naming conventions for those specific lands so succinctly that it it really works like Temple of Deceit is a vault tech facility do you know what I mean? Temple of Deceit because the idea that vault tech were lying to the vault dwellers mm-hmm. 
you've got the Temple of Abandon is Dinky the Dinosaur and the uh, world's second largest thermometer, which is obviously like a, a visitor attraction. So it's like, hey, we're going to, it's, it's abandoned. Let's, let's you know, let's, uh, I've knocked down my joke for the second time today. <laughs> Third time on the podcast. Um, like, it's the idea like, hey, let's go to like this fun park and do a cool thing. You know, I, I like, I like that. And, you know, I, I do enjoy with Universe Beyond that for the staple cards, maybe it's just the new cards I don't like. Maybe for the staple cards, it opens up other ideas of like what these things can be and what they can do. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because you and I have often had this debate where it's, you know, when we went to Ravnica and we look at a mountain and it's like a skyline of peaks and spires. Mm. And you're like, how is that a mountain? What is the what is the mountain aspect? And mm. I go, well, it's the feel of a mountain. It's their mountain range. Mm. Or like when someone goes, you know... It's an island. So why is it always like a sea? That's literally the absence of an island, you know, and how does that produce Blue Man or an X, Y, and Z? And, you know, it's they're feeding into the feeling of a thing yeah. rather than the... Like, it doesn't, it doesn't sound as nice to say um, red ley line, right? Like, cause that's essentially yeah. what it is, is that it's, it's a sort of... Whatever, whatever, whatever plane you are on or, or whatever, it's a way to tap into um, an amount, a manner of that particular st- of type, you know? Your Tainted Peak is a, mount, is a, is a place of red manner and it's tainted so you can also pull black manner from it right yeah. like so again like, i guess the word mountain is kind of supposed to be like in in like inverted commas I'm like it's a mountain and by that I mean you can get red manner from it right yeah. and i guess that's what should be the t- definition which i guess from a flavor point of view is what it's the only rules text that's on a mountain not the over explained ones from the secret lair but just use <laughs> the brackets of tap add red yeah, yeah that's that's the mechanic of what the what the mountain is doing regardless of what the word mountain says you know it's actually the typing um, that matters more to it, and it's interesting that you bring up the lands because for the first time, I think since universes beyond have been doing have been doing this, they have created a cycle of lands that's new and only to the product. Oh, really? Well, so the that. filter lands from Odyssey, uh, so you know Sungrass Prairie and all of that, uh-huh. all of that cycle, they've now done the enemy cycle to go oh, alongside okay. it. Which and thank and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what they are now, and you're gonna be like, oh, okay, I understand why it's not an issue. Because otherwise you would be like, okay, well, if you ever want these lands. I mean, they're not actually, I wouldn't say this now as well. I don't think filter lands are very good. These aren't the filter lands like from the uh, Lawin block, uh, Shadowmoor block of where, you know, you can put in a red, um, to, you know, you've got your dual land and it can tap for one of either color. Um, it taps for colors or you can put a one of either color to get a combination a of combination two. A combination of the two, yeah. Whereas this is just you put in a, a generic and you get out one of each of the colors that it's representing. So overflowing basin for blue green, sun scorched divide for red white. Viridescent Bog for black green, Fer- Ferris Lake for blue red, and Desolate Mire for white black. Now, what you'll probably notice is none of these have place names. None of these are specific to Fallout. All of these can be reprinted into a regular normal standard set. Yeah. So I think that it, it's, it's sneaky because <laughs> they've. It's obviously clearly something they were like, well, there's there's a need there's a need for these cards and we don't actually have them yet and we don't have the filters lands in. If we're going to do the other filter lands, we might as well do the other ones. Fuck it, let's let's actually just print new ones. And again, they're not so powerful that people are going to be like, holy shit, they printed new dual lands mm. in the in the Fallout set and now I need to go and get them. Which they could have done, you know, they could have been assholes and printed some really 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 powerful cards in that are like format defining, but nothing is egregious. Mm. Even the the use of serial numbering, which we've never, we haven't, I don't think we've ever spoken about it ever. I'm not a big fan of it anyway, because I don't like the, uh, uh, foiling used to be the reason to make a card more impressive. And now that they've got six different foilings, they had to find another way to make the card feel super oh, well, like, well um, worthy. They, is it serial number, serializing, is that what they call it? Yeah. With like and one of one and all that kind of exactly. stuff. Exactly. Yeah. The only cards they've serialized from this set are the bobbleheads, which makes sense because in the they're game, collectibles. they're collectibles. Yeah. So I kind of like that. I actually feel like if anything, that's, that's how the flavor if if this if this had been the first time they'd done that it's kind of like with the one ring how there was the one version that was extra super round like that makes sense because it's it's the one ring there shouldn't be fucking thousands of them played around but the, the only world. the only way they could do that is by having other ones that weren't the only one exactly of course exactly exactly um so yeah there's even things like that i feel like the flavor fall falls almost exactly correctly and again i'm, I'm we're not going to go into how um i, I kind of w- wish maybe we we had a little bit more um uh, game knowledge to, to be able to do this is looking at like the legendary creatures and whether or not they fit in to like their characters from the fallout set f- match their colors within what we'd expect from the color this, pie. Is, this is my problem hmm. this, that's so funny that you bring that up because that's exactly why i feel that universes beyond is going to start having it's going to be a, a diminished returns mm. 
Whereas maybe there was a thought uh, that I kind of held to as well that the more you add in, the less of an annoyance it's going to be because you can ignore what you want to ignore and know what you want to know. Mm. But for people who really love diving into the lore of these things, there are only so many fandoms you can know everything about. And mm. even the ones you're interested in, you might not have the in-depth lore of everything. Lord of the Rings, I know a huge amount about. And I still was like, I'm not sure about some of these colour pairings or how to kind of engage with them. Yeah. Because it's someone else's lens and someone else's idea. That's the idea, it. yeah. Your, how you see the character might not be how Magic saw the character. So, it, so as much as, yes, we should have maybe invited our friend on AJ who knew everything about Fallout and he could tell us what's going on. You know, and, and I know other podcasts and whatever do that. It's, it's going to become increasingly difficult for fans of Magic the Gathering to engage with the game that's in front of them mm. on a deeper level than, oh, he's red, therefore he must be kind of angry. Or like, oh, that guy wearing a fancy coat, he's in black, white, I guess that makes he, means he's a bit up himself. Mm. Like The big thing for me, I think, that kind of steps over that line was, weirdly enough, in the Doctor Who decks of where you're looking at like creatures like Don and Noble and it's like, how are you a tutu? When an average sh- soldier in magic is a one-one, like it, it clearly is a different translation of power and toughness. Yeah. You know, like it doesn't follow a. Tr- it's one of the things. Almost like it's another aspect you kind of have to ignore. Yeah, you know, and it's mu- it makes much more sense for Donna Noble to be a red character because she's very impulsive, whereas like Danny Pink is definitely going to be a blue character because he was more thoughtful and um, intellectual in the way that he handled things. You know, he wasn't as he was probably one of the least impulsive characters that's from that kind of era of, of, of Doctor Who so I, again you can justify it but there are certain aspects you kind of have to glaze your eyes and go okay let's ignore that bit because obviously they have to put a power and toughness on it because it's a Magic the Gathering playing card we don't want to make the card unplayable and then they start going through the it starts to feel less like a smooth it feels if you can start to see the, the seams you know where yeah. we're trying to mix these two things together more I feel like this actually pulls that off a lot better but again maybe that's just because I have slightly less affinity to some of these characters so I'm not so annoyed when I look at it and go well why are they this instead of this you know why I, I saw one discussion about uh, Agent Frank Horrigan who's like the big boss at the end of um, Fallout 2 um, and in, in they've made him like an indestructible 8-6 trampler dude or whatever and people were complaining saying like is he really a warrior shouldn't he be a soldier Sure. And it's things like that of where you go, and then other people turn around and go, well, magic defines warriors as pe- being people that are more like, and, and it's like, we, yeah, but we're not asking magic to tell us what character he is. We're, we're asking the Fallout franchise to tell us what, what creature type he should be. And it's yeah. like, well, when you're mixing the two together, which one supersedes the other? Yeah. You know, like, RK Ganon, like, could you say, yeah, he's a human doctor. It's like, but doctor wasn't a thing before. Shouldn't have he been like a human artificer? Yeah. Well, that would, that would make so much more sense to me and I think would would make it far far more powerful for magic players to understand that and translate that because you're right they, if they if they just print whatever creature type they want onto these things nothing matters mm. it's almost like it's not magic anymore it's just we're using the magic mechanics and I know I still I wish I'd never said this on this fucking podcast but I did a whole thing where I was like well maybe magic is just a game system that we use to translate these IPs but I think that was before I realised that they were just going to go, well, nothing matters. Yeah, yeah, there still needs to be, as it's like, like we said about like the uh, fucking um, target board for artwork, like it's kind of funny because we kind of go against it with that of where we want to see further and further. But then look at some of the secret layers of where even I look at it and go, that's too much. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, like, yeah. come on. Like, I mean, it's fine as a collective piece, but as a game piece to play with, it's it's not. I actually think the art direction in this set is not so bad. It's I, not very egregious. I don't think it's egregious at all. No, I, th- I think they've really, they've translated it well and they've kind of got a good middle ground. Um, and it's funny that you said mentioned about the uh, creature types because they only actually added two creature types. One of which being synth, which kind of annoys me because you could just use construct construct yeah what was wrong with that uh, because i guess again they want to make it specific like it's like saying what's the difference between a zombie and a phyrexian you know and they, within magic they still did that definition of going yeah. well we can't just make all phyrexian zombies and it's like well yeah is it is it worth like a rattering a hundred creatures to be phyrexian i don't know whatever and then the other one weirdly enough that you probably would have assumed already had one in the, in the game sloth oh right the lumbering mega sloth is the first sloth ever printed yeah magic but like you know what you're gonna have like arboreal like you know, it's I fine. mean, the thing, like, yeah, I guess there's maybe only a couple of creatures that you look back at throughout magic history and go, oh, okay, maybe that needs to be a sloth, because I don't think they've done very many of them. But, I mean, when you start getting to mammals, it all becomes a, aren't they all just beasts? Well, I guess that is the big one, isn't it? You know, yeah. like, aren't all mammals just some form of beast? But I guess there's a difference between a bee being a beast and having bestial qualities. Yeah, I guess they use beast to be just sort of, like, generic 
thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like what's a you know what's a carvu at the end of the day. Exactly right. Yeah. And again, can't you just call that a carvu then? Like, if you've made up your own species, why is it then also just a be- you know whatever? We kind of like the cre- creature typing also becomes very very tricky. But you know, coming back to, it, I don't think yeah, I don't think any of these are particularly out of. And again, they've only done two additional ones, so it's not that they've really pushed it too far. Even alien was already a creature type because of infinity. So the well, the one alien a lot, token. Well, a lot get. of this one, it's funny. A lot of this one because of the style of humor that the Fallout series has, like the bobbleheads, or I'm thinking almost specifically the bobbleheads, mm. you can imagine that have been being in the last Unfinity mm. set. It does feel very, this whole thing feels very Unfinity of where it's like semi-futuristic, uh, like almost like the Jetsons kind of yeah. style of, 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 of um, technology. Um a couple of other stuff that's good. We could, we could talk ancillarily about random bits and pieces. A couple of cards that I think are really cute. Breakdown, two and a green. It's your typical instant destroy an artifact or an enchantment, and then you create a junk token. It's literally the weapon falling apart. It's, it's little. It's, sometimes I don't need all the bells and the whistles to make a Magic the Gathering card feel kind of cool. Well, yeah, I think those simple, simple translations are really fun. Yeah. And I also think they are far. I, there's, there's a real artistry to having things with restrictions. Mm. And they say that creativity is is flourishes better in a box. If you give someone an infinite palette of colours and then say, create me a masterpiece, they'll spend the first 50 years of their life picking what colours they're going to yeah. pick. If you say, here you go, here's red and green, create me a masterpiece, that decision's already done. Mm. They now need to focus on how they use those colours. Mm. And so this idea of going, well, we'll have all these different creature typings in universes beyond I know I, I all my arguments are about the large universes beyond I do understand that we'll give them we'll do whatever we like in terms of like the mechanics and make it do this really specific thing we'll use all these keywords we'll give them a new token and blah 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 blah. whereas actually do you I mean do you remember things like cards like Stab Wound this is my oh god I sound like a fucking boomer but do you remember like cards like Stab Wound mm-hmm. minus two minus two you lose two life at the beginning of your upkeep and just the idea of going, you're a little bit weaker, Shank, and, start, and then and start also you're bleeding out. out, yeah. And that's something that sticks with you. Yeah. Whereas that feels like a universe's beyond card. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Because it's so blue. it's so colloquial. Yeah. It's so colloquial and on the nose, but then also it reads so. Because that's the other thing I think is kind of interesting is magic because they're defining their own flavor. It doesn't sometimes feel. I I don't know what's the right word for it, but it doesn't feel ultra specific. But because they're taking a card or an, an, a theme that already works outside of their IP, mm. and then going how do we how do we translate all of those aspects of that person into into magic abilities? It all it always feels ultra defined, which sometimes comes across as heavy handed and too wordy. But when they get it right, it feels so good. But you can also tell it doesn't feel like it's typical magic space because magic space doesn't normally go to that to that specific yeah. of a degree. I just wonder if, if they hadn't been so specific in some of the designs for Fallout or for Doctor Who or whatever, and they did stick to more sort of straight down the line magic card design going, we're not going to create a junk token, we'll create something like, we'll, we'll still call it gold or treasure or whatever, mm. but the artwork will have a different story. That I don't think people who were looking forward to Fallout would go, well, they've not really done Fallout justice. I think mm. what they'd go is like, oh, fuck, so it creates a treasure token because that's the resource. You know, like, they could call it, you know, a treasure. They could put a picture of a bottle cap on it. They well, might weird, actually they, they literally have, yeah, they enough, have, right. they have nuka, nuka, uh, but, the nuka bottle. But that that that's fine. What they didn't do, and this was a correct decision then, is that they didn't create a bottle cap token, which is then another resource style token. Do you know mm. what I mean? Like, so I think... Maybe there's a balance, and maybe I'm just trying to go the other way because they've gone so far one direction, I want to go the other. Mm. But, yeah, I don't think anyone was complaining no. when things fit properly. That's what theme decks yeah. are all about. You making it work within well, I think I game. think it's funny that Nuka Code Vending Machine was one of the first cards that was shown, and it is one tap and create a food token, because obviously the bottle, you drink it and it's nourishing, but then once you sacrifice the food token take the cap off to drink it, the cap then becomes a treasure. Yeah, perfect. That is so slick. Yeah, and that's literally just saying food and treasure, and you're just doing this. You're just make, putting it on a magic card, but you're putting. You, you, you've taken a very easily digestible magic mag, magic process of making a token. When you sacrifice that token, you get a different type of token, and then you put a bit of flavor from a different, a whole different IP on it, and you go, "But that's genius." Yeah, it's that's like, really good. It's almost like it was made for it, you know. And there's a couple of others that I think that are, are, are quite quite good, well rested. Being something that's in most RP- RPGs, of once you've uh, gone to bed, you wake up with a little bit of a perk. Uh, the idea is it's an enchantment for one and a green. Whenever the enchanted creature, um, sorry, it's an aura uh, enchant creature. When the enchanted creature has, when this creature becomes untapped, 
put two plus one plus one counters on it. You gain two life and draw a card. It only triggers once per turn. Because you can only, you know, you can only be one well rested once per day. Yeah. Um, and again, it's a nice little perk. It translates. It makes sense. No, 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 no notes. No notes. Um, another, another one. Almost perfect. Four green, white. This is another perk. Uh, an enchantment aura. I like that a lot of the perks are enchantments because the idea is that it is something you layer onto yourself and it just stays with you. Um, enchant creature. Enchanted creature has base power and toughness 9, 10 and has indestructible. Almost perfect sets all of your stats to be 9 out of 10. Mm. So the fact it sets your base level stats to 9, 10. 9 out of 10. Yeah. I don't know. It, it's it's things no, like it's, that. It's cool. that are just... I, I, think, I think the fallout, what the, the kind of giant crib note for this versus other universes beyond that they've done Aside from maybe Street Fighter, I guess you could claim is also in the same bracket, but mm. because because it's a video game, because mm. it's designed to be played, it has mechanics and is gamified. I think it translates so much, and and also the fact that Fallout is an RPG, yeah, it it translates so much better. We'll see if something like Assassin's Creed can live up to that, yeah, because it's a different style of RPG. It's more of an action RPG. Mm. Where there is a linear path from start to finish. I wouldn't want Uncharted, the universe is beyond set, you know, for example, because it's. Yeah, it's not your own personal story. Because again, the other thing is, I guess, that when you're playing this game, right, is that these are different things that you've experienced in your own time under your own control. And then when you look at the card, you go, I remember when I experienced that. Yeah. And then you read the card and you go, that's exactly how it felt like when I experienced it. Well, I mean, it. You, you were talking before we started recording about the fact that they, they're they using quest counters. Yes, exactly. Some A lot of the legendary creatures either gain quest counters or give quest counters and then something will happen based on the number of quest counters. Like, obviously these characters give you quests. Yeah. And the quest counter was already a thing. They didn't even have to make it up for the set. Yeah, you know, yeah, it was yeah. already a thing. So, and that's exactly it. It's, it's, it's taking something that already exists and using it in a way that magic does, would, wouldn't have used it. And I guess the big question I would say is that if you reskinned like they have, and they've done universes within versions of a bunch of these cards, I think weirdly enough out of all of them, as you know, I'm thinking about it now, even like the... Um, Walking Dead ones, I think, suffer from this. If you read the card as a universes within card first, would you look at it and go, that's a bit quirky? Yeah. And if you look at it and go, that, that's a bit quirky, and that's what I mean by what I was saying before, is I think that there are, especially within within like legendary creatures where they're trying to put so much deliberate, specific flavour on, you read it and you're like, you wouldn't do that with a normal Magic the Gathering card. Even something like the, the most recent Atrata, where um, she has all that cloaking mechanic, putting face down. like it always, It's quite wordy. But it's not. It doesn't feel ultra specific. It actually feels just generic. Of whenever an assassin hits, you do, you cloak a card, and then you can you, you have a way to play the cloak cards for cheaper. Cool, fantastic. Whereas a lot of these cards, you get a universes within version of it. Um, I guess even I guess your I guess Ver- Vernog and Hardy. Well, I was George just thinking about actually kind of get away with it because I feel... because the the Stranger Things universes beyond cards didn't make any new mechanics because it was just a very limited set. Yeah, they apart had from the Friends Forever. Friends Forever, yeah. but that's just another partner. Like. So when they did do the universes within cards versions, you were like, sick, it's whilst, because they all skin them to Innistrad style, mm. whilst the mechanics weren't maybe totally specific to Innistrad, clues being originating on Innistrad but can be used on other sets, like, it didn't feel like you were going, well, what the fuck are these things? Mm. Like, no, they're magic cards. Like, yeah, I think maybe the red-blue one reads a little weird. I think Max, I think both Max and, oh, I've forgotten. Eleven. Eleven also, yeah, but eleven really clearly reads weird because it oh, says sure. about the hand size of eleven. I think I get it depends. I think each one has its ones that you can forgive and ones that you can't. Like Sean Lee, the multi kicky one, it works better when it's her because she's a kicker. So when you read the multi kick, you're like, oh, that makes sense. When it's when it takes you take that and put it within universes within, you read it, and you go, that's a lot of fucking words. Yeah, you know, and it's a really cool ability, but it worked better as a universes beyond card because they specifically wanted that mechanic to be from that character. As soon as you make that character within magic. It doesn't make sense anymore because you're like, but I don't know this character. Why is why has it got multi kicker? Do they do both Street Fighter and Stranger Things universes within cards as Innistrad characters? Are mm. they all Innistrad? Um, no, I don't even. I don't think. Oh, maybe it is because it's because the the Shang the Shang Li one, um, the the multi kicker one, she's got lightning blades, and I don't think the light blades are something that's on Innistrad. In, in oh, maybe not because. I- They've got the swords, obviously, the Serra swords and stuff like that, which glow. But I think she's literally got like laser. The swords. green, the green white one is. I can't remember. I'll have to have a look. We'll have to have a look. That's sorry. That's a thing. Okay, one last little bit of flavor, like for the generic set from me, that was like interesting, and maybe this feeds into a lot of what I've been saying before. But the set code, pip, pip, p i p. What were you supposed to do? F a l? Because I think that's Fallen Empires already. Fallout. You could be yeah. F a l or f o t, f o u. What was your? What is your particular issue with Pip? FOC Fallout Commander? 
Sure. What's your specific issue no with No other three-letter set code. And I looked, so mm. I might have missed, but I was scanning through literally as we've been talking. Has that convention of, well, it's a name from the thing that we're doing in. It's all some right. reduction of the set name with maybe Commander. Or yeah, I guess it makes it a little bit harder. If you go like, oh, well, I wonder what the set name for Fallout is, and you all of the normal ones you'd go for, it wouldn't be. It's completely different. But it's, it's now another thing that's going like, hey, the is IPs th- informing the game. It's like, it's the fucking set code. Yeah, like, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It's, that's one of, yeah, one of those things. Of, it, does, it, does, does it feel more flavorful, or does it feel a little bit like, is it it's unnecessary? It's very distracting. Yeah, it's unnecessary and distracting. They yeah. fuck themselves as well. What if, what if in the future they have a set that's like, you know, I don't know, pel- Pelicans in Peril. <laughs> As <a set. laughs> bring me the Blo- pelicans Bloomborough in peril. two pelicans in peril right and now they can't use pip true I mean I guess there's only so many three have to call it or something they're gonna have to add an extra an extra letter it's gonna have to be a four letter set code well I think one. the anthology series had a four letter set code really them, that's yeah. funny that's funny Cool. So, I mean, I think to to wrap up because um, we have like um, <laughs> I didn't mean to be this grumbly. I actually quite I actually think this no, works good. a lot better than the Doctor Who ones. Yeah, right. right. And I actually I agree. Um, I I actually really enjoy playing the Doctor Who decks, and I think that for me, I'm always going to enjoy playing new new decks anyway because it expands my my, my play experience. Um, so I mean, that's probably not as much of a statement as as, as it should be. But um, having played with the moth the the mutant menace deck a few times, the rad counter is really cool. It's nice to play with a slightly different mechanic, so it feels like I'm playing slightly different magic, but it still very much feels like magic. Yeah. And I guess it's the similar thing from the Doctor Who cards and the Warhammer cards of where it still very much feels like I'm playing magic, but it does feel like a slightly different version of the game. Saying that, with how weird playing like face down creatures was from um, Murders at Carl of Manor and some of the mechanics there, and like I, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's, I don't know if it is as different <laughs> to have a universes beyond set as it is to have a universes within the set nowadays. I feel like the way that they con- um, convolute and rejig and repackage mechanics like craft and discover and stuff like that from like Lost Caverns, I feel like. Magic the Gathering sets in general are still, I'm maybe getting to that point of complicatedness anyway, but because it's not showing me this character that I've beloved for years, I actually have less affinity to it than I do the universes beyond sets of where I go, oh yeah, I remember playing that game. That's a really cool ex- expression of, of magic. Yeah. And maybe we're just in a weird little slump because I have felt it for the last few sets where I'm like, just doesn't, I don't, there's a lack, almost a lack of inspiration. It feels yeah. like, and it's much easier to be inspired by something that's or you've already got a love for and go, hey, how can I make magic work in this for, for, for this game? Or how do I make magic work for my favourite Harry Potter character or whatever? That might feel more exciting to them than going, let's go back to Xalan again. Or let's make an enemy, let's make a, a set about villains. Maybe the villain set will, will, be, will be the new thing because it's a new set. We're going to a new plane. Mm. And it's a whole new open world that they can mess around with. Bloomborough feels like it's quite well inspired. Well, yeah, that's it. That's Duskmorn feels quite inspired. So maybe we're just in a little slump of revisit planes of where they've tried some well, certain do you things know what and it's maybe not worked. It is, and I really don't. I really don't mean this to be bashing uh, American pop culture because God knows, as English people, we've ingested it just as much as anyone else mm. has. But the cowboys, the detectives, the Americana, even Nuka Pen has been fairly Nuka recent. Mena, it's all. It's all that yeah. to a degree. So maybe us and like the horror house obviously has its roots in sort of like American scream queen, queen pop culture. Yeah, but it is definitely a, a really radical take. Mm. And Bloomborough, <laughs> maybe maybe I'm just a fucking shill for European like folklore. But like yeah, having like you know animals on a Arthurian style quest. Yeah, it sounds bad. That sounds great, mate. Love yeah, it. love the idea of it. Um, I guess it's interesting as well because this is also an American set, right? The Fallout thing. So, but I don't, I don't mind that as much. Um, but I guess I don't know. Again, again, I, I like it. I like it. I think it was good. Don't think it's not too egregious. I'm kind of my worry will be for the next big set that isn't something like Lord of the Rings that feels that that has quote unquote enough to make a set about. Yeah. I think they'll probably be careful. I don't think it feels like they're being reckless yet it doesn't feel like they're catching away from um, getting away from themselves it does feel like every time they do this it does feel like it's grounded by people that actually care about the thing that they're making yeah i will say that yeah for sure like it does actually genuinely feel like a, a heartfelt uh, product you know that i can and that's much easier to get behind than throwing uh, a fedora on everyone and calling and them detectives people, people <laughs> loved it i i well i like that to be fair to be, i'm just again to, I'm each, to each to each their own i liked that they took that swing and they stuck that landing um for me anyway like people loved this set like the they just had uh, Magic Con Chicago mm-hmm. 
the amount of fucking hype around Fallout there was mm-hmm. great from Magic players and Magic content creators. Mm. Like, you know, so... So, it still stands. For all my grumbling, for every episode of this that we go through where I get more and more into my little fucking magic hole, I still can't help but look up and look past my own bullshit and say, people are enjoying it. Not everything is for me. Mm. And if it's still paying reverence to magic in some sort of way, then fucking fine. Like, you mm. know. I think my last statement is going to be, um, Mara was asked recently about whether or not they'll ever, ever do a university beyond set, uh, because obviously all of these are made as isolated products. Obviously there's limited printing after a couple of years, it might be really hard to get hold of these. And if there are, you know, some random chase cards that appear over the next couple of years, because again, like there's, there's powerful effects in these decks, you know, they haven't, they're not underpowered by any stretch of the imagination. Um, they play, play well out of the box and they've got some strong strong abilities. Um, he said there's no plan because apparently there isn't a market for it. I think that's just a matter of time. Give it a couple of years and a few more universes beyond sets coming out. I think there probably is definitely game there to be able to just put a bunch of the more powerful cards or the rarer cards and more expensive cards in a set together and re-release it. How that would work as a marketing as a marketed set, I have no idea. But I do stand by that if you're kind of even just a little bit tempted, like this isn't me trying to promote, you know, going out and spending money on magic cards or stuff, but um, it's the fo- FOMO is very real, but at the same time, these are good products. So maybe don't like feel religiously like you have to buy everything. But if you are curious, dip your toes in because every time I've done that, it's it's it, if I felt like it's a boon, you know, like every time I've dipped my toes into one of these universes beyond, I've wanted to get more involved with it. Not oh god, that was a mistake. I wish I hadn't bought it. Cool. Give us a sponsor, please. <laughs> <laughs> wow, the most polarized podcast on whether universes beyond is good or not gets universes beyond sponsor. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, we we I I'll, I'll sell my soul. We can we can lie, Andy. Yeah. People think we like each other. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> we can get away with whatever we want. <laughs> Uh, email us at I keep saying at every time email us mtflavoring at gmail.com our twitter is at mtflavoring with an OU it's the British the whole spelling. U oh you my personal twitter is at Andy Bannerface Nathan's yours at is the fox in the moon tell a friend about this podcast uh, I think we'll get into rhythm of doing these once a month I know there's a couple more that you want to do maybe in quick succession before yeah. Thunder Junction comes out uh, and yeah we're, we're seeing more and more of each set as it goes along the new stories for Thunder Junction are yes. coming out. Are you, are, you, are you keeping up with them or are you doing your thing that you always do and doing the morning one go at the I end? really shouldn't do that. I think I need to read the ones that are coming out now. So we're on like episode four now. So we're episode four. Well, it'll be episode probably from today. I don't know if we're getting a side story or not today, but it's either episode five or the last side story. All right. Because we've had, I think, three of the four sides. I don't know if it's five or five. Five and five. I need not. to get reading them, I think. Uh, but the side stories are all in isolation little ones. We've just had an episode with Nashi, which is quite cute. Um, but yeah, the side stories are, I think, up to like episode four, I think, maybe out of six. I think they're going to be six stories. Um, it's not bad. It's not bad reading. Cool. It's not bad reading. Thank you so much for listening. This has been Magic Flavor. We'll see you soon.